In this, the first of a series of short podcasts, I'm going to describe the concept of psychodynamics, starting with an overview, then with the concept's historical roots, and finally outline how this concept is still relevant to contemporary music psychotherapy. Psychodynamics can be described as the forces, motives and energy generated by our deepest human needs but also that the mechanics of these human needs relate to the transformations and exchanges of psychic energy within a mind, and that these energetics of emotional states can be found in the id, ego and superego structures that Sigmund Freud first conceived of, and that these structures have their roots in our early childhood development. But we have to go back to the Victorian era to find the birthplace of the concept of psychodynamics. And as early as 1874, the German scientist Ernst von Bruch gives us, I think, our first psychodynamic understanding of the heat of an internal emotional experience being transformed into the work of a musical expression. In his 1874 paper, Lectures on Physiology, he borrows from the first law of thermodynamics. This states that the total amount of energy in any isolated system remains constant over time, and that this energy can change both its location and its form within this system, but can neither be created or destroyed. For example, chemical energy can become kinetic energy. Bruch believed that you could apply this first law of thermodynamics to all living organisms and see them as living systems governed by this principle of energy conservation. That same year he began to clinically supervise a first year medical student called Sigmund Freud. Freud began to describe psychological energy just like any other energy, as a constant and that it could only be displaced between aspects of mental functioning within the closed system of mind and body. He created a topographical model of the mind, like an iceberg whose topography is mostly submerged in dark unconscious waters. He compartmentalised this iceberg into three distinct areas of mental functioning. Firstly, the id, a repository of unconscious primitive survival instincts like sex and aggression. Then the superego that develops through experience, both guiding the ego through ideals, delineating what the individual should become, and judging the ego, appropriating guilt and shame. Finally, the ego's task is to hold in balance the powerful, potentially overwhelming feelings generated by the id and the potentially crushing verdicts handed down by the internal authority of the superego and to reach out to a growing sense of reality outside this system. Libido, or mental energy, like the steam in this Victorian steam-driven piston shown on the left, builds up in one of these three areas of mind, and the pressure created displaces energy, or as we're now calling it, libido, into another compartment. As Freud said in relation to ego growth, for example, where id was, so ego will be. Of course, this transaction can work the other way, and in order to manage annihilatory anxiety, for example, where our very existence feels threatened, regardless of the reality of this, the ego displaces rather than destroys this physical quantity of energy into rage or a sexual act, perhaps. The superego may also exert pressure on the ego through guilt and shame. And the meaning that might have evolved from unmanageable memories gets repressed instead into the unconscious, leaving only affect at the surface of the body as a symptom of the patient's dis-ease. <laughs> 
Freud also famously developed the technique of free association as central to his new psychoanalytic therapy. The patient is invited to begin anywhere and talks about anything, while the analyst maintains for his part a stance of free-floating attention, picking up the buried unconscious meaning as it reveals itself between the words or underneath the words as affect. In this reverie, he hopes to reconstruct the patient's unconscious. He described this as becoming a particular kind of receiver, like a telephone tuned into the patient's wavelength. Freud realised from the very outset, from the very first psychoanalytic case, in fact, where the analyst was Joseph Brewer and the patient Anna O., that he had a serious problem with the neutrality implied by the free-floating attention that he was trying to maintain. That in fact Brewer was being drawn into the dynamics of the patient's psyche and that he was deeply affected by the patient. And this began to be described as a counter-transference enactment. And it is this affect-driven dynamic that is so important to contemporary music psychotherapists. When a patient comes to see a music psychotherapist who is working psychodynamically, the presenting condition is seen as a relational difficulty, but also as an affect-driven dis-ease that will manifest in the transference between patient and therapist because the internal dynamics from the patient will communicate to the therapist through affect. In 1985, the analyst and developmental psychologist Daniel Stern, in his seminal book The Interpersonal World of the Infant, describes affect attunement as the expression of the quality of feeling in a shared affective state. He continues that affect attunement creates the foundation for the ability to recognise that human inner experiences, including affect states, are shareable. This is also known as interpersonal communion. It is only in the presence of affect attunement that feeling states within one person can be knowable to another and that they both can sense without using language, that the transaction has occurred. In my next film, I will look exclusively at three essential, interrelated, observable clinical phenomena in music psychotherapy. Projective identification, introjective identification and containment. <laughs>